Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Thank you so much again for being here to worship today. And uh, I want to just recap a little bit about what we've been going through in this series that I felt led to bring to you. Because the truth is, man, I want to encourage you to get in the race. I want to encourage you to get in the race because here's the thing. Some of us, we all started at the starting line. At some point, we got to the starting line. We came to a knowledge of realizing our need for Jesus. We realized that we needed to surrender our lives to him. We realized we needed his grace and his forgiveness of our sins. We realized all these things, and we surrendered our lives right there at the starting line with him. But we never got in the race. And listen, the race is not necessarily this. We don't sum up our race and being followers of Jesus by attending corporate worship with the body of believers. The truth is, is the race is getting in that relationship with Jesus, that intimate, intimate relationship where you're coming to know him intimately. And how do you get to know Jesus intimately but by living out what Jesus told us to do? That's the race. It is a marathon. It's full of obstacles. Because you know what? When we get serious about trying to live out what Jesus told us to do, being ambassadors, being ambassadors for Christ, understanding that our identity is in him and we represent his kingdom. See, things have changed. We're not... So much, this kingdom's important, but this kingdom is perishing. We got our eyes set on something imperishable, the kingdom of God that is imperishable. And, and now that we belong to that kingdom, we are now, we have become heralds of that good news that has saved you and me, the grace that was offered to you and me. And so now what mattered to Jesus now matters to me. You see, his love for sinners should matter to you and to me. His willingness to die for sinners should matter to you and to me. We should care about the fact that our church is not full. We should want to see this church full with new believers, with people who've never surrendered their lives to Jesus. But you want to know how that's going to happen? Not just by me but by all of us getting in the race, that intentional attitude of getting up, saying, Lord, help me to live the life today that would reflect your light and your truth to those who are around me today. And if I should get occasion to open my mouth and share the good news of who you are with somebody, make me bold that I could say those words. And I trust that you'll give me the words to say if I open my mouth. I will not walk in fear, but I will be ready in season and out of season to share the hope that is within me. That's the prayers. That is the race. That is getting in the race. The truth is, some of us started at the same place. Some of us started running the race, but some of us have stopped running. You could still be here today and have stopped running because you may have given up in the obstacles. The challenge has got too hard. He said, I'm not going to share. It's too hard. I might offend somebody. I might say the wrong thing. And so you don't share. But the truth is, we need to make ourselves available, and we need to be willing. And if we'll make ourselves available and we'll be willing, I promise you the Lord will use us. And that right there is how we begin to understand the words like the Apostle Paul said, that I may know him that I may know him and the fellowship or in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, that intimacy of knowing Jesus. We will only truly know Jesus when we are truly living out Jesus. So we began this series because I wanted to encourage you because these are challenging times. Like I said, look, I'm, I'm looking at all of you, and all of you got a mask on. This has never happened before. We've seen this stuff on the news in other countries, but we've never seen this before right here on our soil. And, and this is where we are right now. And now you've got some, some churches that are being told they can't sing in certain places of the country. 
Well, I'm telling you right now, I don't need to go on Facebook and post on there, our church is going to meet and we're going to sing. Because you know what? We're going to sing. I don't have to post that on Facebook. We're going to sing. Regardless of what a governor says. Because you know what? The, our faith is a singing faith. And I want to encourage you, man. I want us to be inspired by the Word of God. This is not the time to give up. This is not the time to quit. This is not the time to say the struggle's too hard and I'm done. Or it's easier to stay home. Some people need to stay home. But this ministry of Jesus is going to continue to go on and we're going to have to make those difficult decisions to say, I'm going to participate and get in the race and run the marathon. I want to fight the obstacles. I want to participate in the obstacles. I want to do that because I know that the more that I do those things, the more I'm going to experience Jesus. And the more I experience Jesus, the more I'm going to become like Jesus. Isn't that the goal? It's to become more like him. Amen? You with me? Okay, don't go to sleep on me. The temptation to quit. That's how we started. We started with James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And I encourage you that we need to be striving for the crown. Striving for the crown. And we strive by the crown by getting up each day and saying, I'm going to run today. I'm not going to be idle. I'm not going to sit still. I'm going to run the race today. And then we need to discipline ourselves, which is the second thing that we looked at. Every athlete, and we talked about this, disciplines themselves for the race that's coming. Uh, every football player, before they go play any games, they spend a season of training to get ready. They've got to get their bodies ready to participate in the game. If they haven't trained and haven't done that, they're going to not do well. We have to be disciplining ourselves. And we looked at 1 Corinthians Chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, where Paul talked about that. And then last week, we talked about our, we have to remember our commitment to Jesus by focusing on him. We looked at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, talking about the race, talking about that cloud of witnesses, getting that visual of the arena, being in the arena, being the athlete, about to compete in the games, and you're surrounded by an audience of people in that stadium who are cheering you on. But in this case, Paul's trying to demonstrate, or whoever it was who wrote Hebrews, the author is trying to say this, that we have all of these people who've gone before us, who now fill the stands and who are cheering us on. Moses, Abraham, Noah, all these people who walked by faith, all those people, uh, followers of the Lord who suffered horrible things. They're saying, they're there cheering us on, saying, you can do it. We did it, and you can do it too. Run the race. Run the race, and run for the prize. Run for the prize. So today, I want to conclude with this point, and that's our determination. Our determination to finish. we got to be determined to finish. Now, the greatest motivation for determination in this life, and you know this as well as I do, there is one great determination this should encourage us to be even more determined. And what do you think that greatest motivator for determination is? Somebody just yell it out if you think you got the answer. What do you think? Of course. That's the great Sunday school answer. Let's go a little bit deeper. Thank you, Dan. You're right, though. But, huh? Okay, the prize, but say it again. Winning? Talking about, what, was, what, what was that? Death. We're all going to die. Does that not motivate you? Who knows how much time you got? Who knows how much time you got to run the race? Who knows? I don't know my time. You don't know your time. But the truth is, you and me, we're going to die. And that's why we should wake up each day determined. Determined to live this out. Determined to participate in the race. I want us today to look at the farewell of the greatest champion 
of the faith. Now, of course, Jesus inaugurated the faith. But the champion of the faith, I think we all would agree on, would be who? Paul. And these are his parting words to his protege, his disciple, Timothy. 2 Timothy, chapter 4. Look there with me today. Paul, when he penned these words, we know was in prison. This was his second imprisonment. The first one would have been on par with being in a prison where you're getting fed three meals a day, you have a toilet to do your business in, and you can see people. That was the first imprisonment. Second imprisonment, this is during the reign of Nero, Caesar Nero, and Paul is in a different prison now. It's a dungeon kind of prison. And it's just him and the walls. No windows. No light. No toilet. In a space with all of your body waste and having to smell that and live in that. And probably strip naked but has a chance to write, to encourage. He wants to see Timothy because his plan is to hand that ministry over to Timothy. And towards the end of the epistle here, Paul gives specific instructions to Timothy of what to bring and so on and so forth because it's probably going to be the last time Paul sees Timothy, and the truth is we don't know if they saw each other. We don't know if that happened. But what we do know is this, is that Paul's hearing that had taken place did not go well, and Paul knows he's going to die. He knows that. That's why he wants Timothy to come see him. And he does die. He gets uh, beheaded under the reign of Nero around 67 A.D., These are his final words to Timothy. Verse 6, 2 Timothy chapter 4, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Now, let's look at these verses a little closer. Paul's saying here that I started the race and I'm finishing well because I kept the faith. Okay, I fought the fight and I've kept the faith. I have finished the race, he says. But notice first he says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. So in Numbers chapter 28, verse 7, we have this, uh, the, the laws for what to do in the tabernacle in the presence of God and what the priest needed to do on behalf of the people to make sacrifices for the people. And of course, they would have to sacrifice the lambs daily for the atonement for the sins of the people, and then they were to pour out this drink offering. So there was first the sacrifice and then a drink offering. Okay. So Paul's defense through pretty much every epistle of his is that he is an apostle and he has sacrificed his life for the Lord Jesus. Remember Romans chapter 12, verse 1? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves a living sacrifice. Right? So we now come to him as a living sacrifice. And now Paul's saying, I have sacrificed my life for the cause of Christ to run in the race, to fight the good fight. Challenges upon challenges upon challenges. Was it worth it all? Have you ever spent 10 years at a job and thought, did I waste 10 years of my life? 
Or have you ever thought about, I've been married to this person for X amount of years and did, have I wasted these years? Or I've been invested in this and did I waste my time? Paul's saying about his walk with Christ that it was worth it all because I never stopped. I never quit. And so he is now a drink offering with this, that in his death, his death is now the drink offering. You see, Paul was confident. He was confident in what he had believed and what he had preached, and he never gave up. And he was confident that in his death, he would be with Jesus. He was confident in that. And he was confident in the fact that he did what God called him to do. Let's look at Philippians back here. Everybody turn with me to Philippians. And let's look at chapter 3. Now, Paul again trying to encourage the churches. He says in verse 12, not that I have already attained or have already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do is forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God and Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind, Again, Paul's saying, have my mindset. You're going to mess up. You're going to stumble along the race. But get up and forget what's behind you. Keep going forward. Keep pressing on because it's worth it. And he says, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Striving for what lies ahead. Paul knew what was coming. He knew he was going to die, but he knew that he was going to be with Jesus. And he says, uh, the time of my departure is at hand. And here, if you were reading it in the Greek, it would be the uh, separating the cart from the ox, the unyoking of the cart from the ox, meaning that my toil and labor is over. My toil and labor and the gospel is over. It's the cart separating, unyoking from the ox to be set free from the toil and labor of the gospel. And what does he say? I know this for certain. I have fought the good fight. It is a fight, isn't it? It is a battle to follow Jesus. Listen, it's easy to surrender your life to Jesus at the starting line. That's easy. Yes, I believe in Jesus. Yes, I believe he died on the cross for my sins. Yes, I want to receive his gift of grace. I want to be a follower of his. Yes. Now that's a little bit of sacrifice on your part, some humility on your part, but the truth is it's always easy to start the race. We've seen this. You've watched this. We've seen those people who started in the Olympics but didn't make it. They burn out in the first challenge. And they fall to the wayside and they don't complete the race. When Jesus talked about the sower of the seed, the different soils that the seed falls upon. And there are some that uh, the seed falls on, it's kind of like a rocky soil. It takes a little root and begins to spring up, but it doesn't hold. It doesn't last. It falls away. You and I both know that you've seen people who gave their lives to Christ and they, they're not participating in the race anymore. You know this. And Paul's saying this, I have stayed faithful. I have fought the good fight because it is a fight. It is a fight truly against ourselves. We're not re- we don't really have to fight with everybody out there. We really have to fight against ourselves because you and I wake up every day with something that pumps through our veins called sin. And we want to participate in sin because there's pleasure in sin. And, and, the, and the desires of the flesh fight against us. The desires for worldly things fight against us. The temptations of the enemy fight against us. And we truly are at war with ourselves every day. Because like Paul said, not that I've already attained or have already been perfected, and you haven't either, and I haven't. 
We fight the good fight every day. But the truth is, if you were laying there and if you get the opportunity, because again, none of us knows how we're going to die. If you were laying there on your deathbed thinking back over your life, could you say this about yourself? That Jesus, the struggle of knowing Jesus and making him known, I have participated in that and I have fought this fight. Not that I attended church faithfully, that's great. I'm glad that you attend church faithfully. I'm glad that you might read a devotion every day. All these things are great. But how many disciples have you made? How many people have you actually poured yourself into and made a disciple of? That's what Paul's talking about here. Because he did that with Timothy. Paul reproduced himself, which is what Jesus called us to do. To reproduce That seed of the gospel that's been placed in you and me should be being reproduced into other people. That we are making disciples. We're bringing them along with us. Remember Paul, follow my example, follow my example. He's leading and they're behind him, walking with him. And he is showing them the way of knowing Jesus. You are called and I am called to make disciples. And you say, well, I think I may have made some disciples. Well, I hope you have, and the place to start is always at home. Did you make disciples of your children? Are they following Christ today? Now, you can't make those decisions for them, but could you honestly say, if, again, if you're laying there on your deathbed, I know I told my kids the truth about Jesus. I tried to model that example for them. I fought the good fight in front of my kids, in front of my wife, in front of my husband. I tried to live out Jesus, and I know that I shared I did those things. At the end of the day, we can't make decisions for people, but could you say and be at peace and be confident with yourself to say, I know that I tried to be the witness that Christ called me to be to my family. That's a place to start. That is really the place to start. Because parents, I can tell you this, you have more influence on your kids, whether you realize that or not. And and they may be doing actions right now, and you might say, I've had no influence on my kids. But the truth is, yes, you have. Because if they wrestle with anything, they wrestle more with what you said to them and know that they're doing what you told them not to do. They may be doing those things, but guess who they're thinking about? You, who they know that you told them not to do those things. They do think about you. Your influence is strong, especially when they're little right now. So he says, I have fought. It is a fight. I have finished the race. What a race it's been. And I have finished it. And you know what? I kept the faith. I never stopped keeping the faith. I stayed faithful. I did what Jesus told me to do. And finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, it's, again, it's that picture of the athletes when they crown them. They're there. Who crowns them? The judges. The judge crowns them. And it's this beautiful, intimate picture that Paul's seeing that I know I'm about to be separated from the cart here and will depart. And I will be in the presence of the judge. And he has this image of Jesus crowning him. You kept the faith. You fought the good fight. You finished your race. You never gave up. You received the crown. And I think that that's what you and I would want too. So he says, the righteous judge will give to me on that day. Now in your Bible, you might notice that that word day is capitalized. So there's also this future day. And that future day is of Christ's return to the world. He says, and not to me only, but to all those who have loved his appearing. It's that second epiphany, second epiphany. So there was the epiphany of Jesus when he first came into the world, born of the virgin, so on and so forth. We know that story. There'll be another epiphany when he appears again the second time to judge the world. Paul's saying that too. And for all who love his appearing, And see, today, you know, we see all the things that are happening and people are talking about, is this the end? Is this the end? Is Jesus coming back? 
I'm seeing people say this stuff on Facebook more and more. And people are being challenged more and more, and we're asking those questions, because when things get hard, we begin to ask those questions. When we see all the calamity in the world, and people are saying that. Today, could you say that you love his appearing? Because the truth is, there should be kind of a healthy fear in us all to appear in the presence of Jesus, to die from here and to appear in front of him and give an account for the life that we lived here. There's that. And then there'll be the ultimate judgment of the world when he judges the world in that appearing. These are the things that Paul is talking about here. That he is trying to encourage Timothy. If we'll notice, let's look back at verse 6 and let's contrast the I there, the pronoun, for I am already being poured out. And look back up at verse 5 and notice that pronoun right there. But you, but you, you're still here. You're still doing the ministry. Notice what Paul says to Timothy. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, for I, my time has come. It's over for me. But you, Timothy, you keep doing the ministry. Now, Timothy had specific calling, specific gifts that God gave to him in the ministry. He's given you and me gifts too. And the truth is, regardless of what those gifts are that we're serving to each other, and regardless of what they could be that you could be doing as ministry out in the community as well, the truth is we all share in the ministry of Jesus that we are all called to share the gospel. To share the gospel with the world that's around us. Jesus commissioned the church. I have people sending me messages on Messenger, on Facebook, you know, wanting to know about the rapture, wanting to know this, wanting to know that about end time stuff. And you know what? We could spend a whole lot of time talking about a lot of that, okay? This eschatology, okay? I'm very fascinated and intrigued by all of that. But this is what I know. Jesus told the disciples in Acts chapter 1, Lord, is the time of the kingdom now? Are you going to restore all things now? And they're asking all these questions. Said, whoa, 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 that's not for you to know. But you shall, be, you shall receive power. You shall be my witnesses to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, to the ends of the earth. What was Jesus saying? Don't get caught up in all that. God's going to take care of all that the way he wants to take care of it. You and I, listen, are never, if you think you can box God in, this is exactly how God's going to end the world. You've already deceived yourself. God gives us some things to know. God for sure tells us in his word that things are going to happen, that the end will come, that he will judge the world through Jesus and all these different things. We get all that. But what did Jesus tell the church to do? What did he tell his church to do? Sit around and talk about him all the time? Sit around and parse Greek verbs all the time? Or get out and show people his love? Let your light so shine among men that when they see your good deeds, they'll praise your Father in heaven. Are these other things important? Absolutely they are. But the church should never get so caught up and bogged down with that stuff that they forsake what Jesus called the church to do. He called us to make disciples. That's what you and me are supposed to be doing. I want to encourage you that part of being in this race is doing that, is making Jesus known. And the truth is, you and I are going to die. It's going to happen. But could you say today, Lord, I have fought the good fight and because of you and because of your grace at work in me, I was able to plant seeds in the heart of this person, this person, this person, this person, this person. And I pray for those seeds. I pray that they will produce fruit for your glory. I pray that in your timing, you would reap a harvest from the seeds that were planted in those hearts that you gave to me. My family, my co-workers, the dude I jogged with every day or whoever that you planted the seed of faith in the heart of that person because you told them, you loved them enough to tell them about Jesus. You see, you and I can't save anybody, but Jesus called us to plant seeds that if we'll just share 
what he's done in our lives, that's a seed planted in the heart of somebody. I got these little drummers I meet with, and next week is supposed to be our last week together. And I'm praying about right now, Lord, how can we keep ministering to them? So I want to encourage you to pray with me for that. And by the way, I just want to thank Suzanne and Darlene and Nora Scarborough who have been so faithful to come every day and do snacks for these guys and these young ladies. And, uh, but man, you know what? I know for a fact seeds have been planted in the hearts of those kids. I know they have. And all I can do is pray that, that God will bring others who will water those seeds. And then when the time is right, he will reap the harvest in their lives. And they will be his followers Stay faithful to him. Stay committed to him. And that's my prayer for you too. And I want you to get in the race. If you fell back back here and you stopped, you haven't shared, you haven't cared about sharing, you've been afraid to share, you've been all these other things, well, forget that. Put that behind you, as Paul said. One thing I do, forgetting that which is behind me, forget that. Take the time you got right now. You don't know how much you got. You might need to make a phone call. And in that conversation, you might have a chance to just go and chuck a seed in there, <laughs> you know. You might be able to write a note or a card to somebody. Send a card to somebody and tell them about Jesus in it. Read this scripture. Point them to a scripture or something. Don't be haughty. Don't be a holier than thou. Don't be some holy roller, but in love. Encourage somebody to pursue a relationship with Jesus. Let's stand together. We're going to pray. And I want to take a minute and I want to pray for those specifically who maybe have not uh, been in the race. Maybe you are a follower. Maybe you did start back here at the starting line, but you got off the track a little bit. You hit some hard obstacles and they've knocked you down and you, you thought you were out of the race, but let's get back on the race today. Or maybe you're here and you've never started. Or maybe you're watching today and you've never started the race with Jesus. And maybe Maybe something was said today that has clicked with you. And if that's the case, I want you today to take that step of faith. Begin the marathon of life with Jesus. It's the greatest adventure you'll ever have in your life, I promise you. To know that you are in a relationship with the creator of all of life, the one who came and died for you. To know and to have his word and to be able to read and grow in the grace and knowledge of who he is. To be able to participate and serve in his mission, in his ministry. You'll see things you never thought you'd see, and you'll do things you never thought you would do. You might actually lead somebody to Jesus. You might actually begin a Bible study with somebody. And look, the gratification that comes in knowing, if you're laying there on your deathbed, you say, man, God, you gave me an opportunity. Look at the fruit that you're producing in this person's life. And you used me to help bring them to you. Man, that's awesome. That's the stuff that will wake you up every day and put you to sleep at night peacefully. Let's pray together. Father God, we praise you today in the name of Jesus. God, thank you first and foremost, God, that you choose. You don't have to use us. You do not have to use. You really don't need us. But you use us to fulfill your will and your purposes in this beautiful, beautiful world that you've created. But as beautiful as it is and as awesome as this world is and as majestic as this world is, it is a broken place because of the sinful humanity that walk across the ground on this place. We destroy your good world through our sin through our selfish desires for power, for greed, for lust, for the pleasures of this world. War after war after war has been started because of the lust and greed and power-hungry people on this planet. And more people have died horrible deaths because of those things that abide in the hearts of all humanity. All of us, even all of us in this room are capable of carrying out some of the most evil the world has ever known. And it can happen if we get out of fellowship with you. We've heard the stories. People who once knew you. People who walked with you. But they became child molesters and destroyed how many lives? 
how many lives they destroyed. Or they raped a woman. Or they killed somebody and tried to cover it up. We hear these stories of people who proclaimed your name for years. All of us should take heed lest we fall. Lord, I pray today for your church, not just my brothers and sisters in this room, but your church around the world right now. Lord, that we would take to heart the commission that you gave to your church, that we would get up each day and fight that good fight, giving ourselves to you and getting in the race every day and running the the obstacle courses that you have for us that day to be faithful witnesses, to show your love, to be people of grace and mercy, not full of hatred and condemnation, but people who are full of love. I pray for us today who know you, that you'll give us the strength, you'll give us the determination to fight the good fight and to finish the race and to keep the faith, Lord. And I pray today for anyone who might be watching. Lord, we know that there are many watching. In fact, there are more watching right now that are in this room. And so, Lord, I pray for them today because I know many of them who, are, who may be watching today have never taken that step of faith and have surrendered their lives to you. But they're watching. So I pray today will be the day of salvation for them. That today they would acknowledge that they are a sinner that they're a sinner. They know they're a sinner. They know the things they've done. They know the skeletons in the closet that they have. But today, that they would repent, and that means to turn from that and to embrace this new way of thinking, to acknowledge that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, that this is the way of salvation that God used to bring salvation to the world, the sacrifice of his son on the cross. This is God's standard, not man's. It's not debatable. This is the standard that he made. So I changed my way of thinking from that to this. And today I call upon your name and I ask you to forgive me of my sins, to come into my heart and to my life, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit and that you would enable me to get up and to start fighting the good fight, to getting in the race of faith, to get into your word, to get into a Bible reading plan, and to pray and to know you more and more each day. That you would put people around me, people who've been walking with you, who could encourage me and disciple me and show me the way of truth. Lord, help us to be those people, those who are helping lead people in the way of truth. And God, I pray for us all today as we live in these uncertain times, during this pandemic and all of these things, God, help us to be faithful during this time. Help us to not get caught up in the distractions, to not get so tangled up and easily ensnared by these things, but to keep our eyes focused on Jesus, to keep our sights on you, and know that you'll lead us through this, and we'll bring some with us if we keep our eyes on you. In your name we pray, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here today.